Court is now in session. You may be seated. Do any of the jurors have any difficulty following the instructions of the court and not discuss the case among yourselves with anybody else during the recess? None of the jurors has answered affirmatively. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, starting tomorrow, we're going to give you a, uh, uh, a bigger jury room, much more room to spread out in. Uh, it seems like uh, there's just not enough uh, room over where you are. So we'll get you a more comfortable place to be during the recesses. Okay. Um, yes, please. Yes, Mr. Kugel. Yes, I do. And what do you recognize that item to be? That was the wallet that I pulled out of the back. And that was the, one of the first items that you pulled out of that third set? Yes, it is. And is that in essentially the same condition it was in when you found it on October 23rd? Yes. I would ask that be marked as the next exhibit, John. Okay. And I would ask for permission to display it, Your Honor, on the Elmo. Amen. Thank you. So, Officer Covey, when you um, opened the wallet, can you describe for me where in the wallet the box cutter was? It was in the uh, zipped area. In this area? Yes, it was. Okay. And, sir, those credit card slots in the wallet, were they full or empty? If you remember. I do not remember. Do you recognize the item I've put in front of you now? Yes, I do. And what do you recognize that item to be? That was the box cutter that was in the wall. And other than that the blade is now retracted, is that in essentially the same condition it was in when you found it on October 23rd? Yes, it was. I'd ask this to be marked as the next exhibit, Your Honor. Sir, is this essentially the condition of the blade when you opened the wallet that early morning? Yes, it was. And the writing on this side of the box cutter, was that writing already present when you found it? It was already present. And turning the box cutter over, was that writing also present when you found the box cutter that early morning? Yes, it was. Yes, I do. And what do you recognize that item as? That was that, what I described as a scuba diving knife in the sheath that was in the backpack as well. <laughs> and is that item in essentially the same condition it was in when you discovered it on October 23rd? Yes, it is. I ask this to be marked as an exit.
And again, that's in essentially the same condition she said it was when you found it that morning, correct? Yes, it is. Thank you. Sir, do you recognize the item I put in front of you? Yes, I do. What do you recognize those to be? Those were the set of keys that were in the also in the backpack that I pulled out. And are those also? Awesome? Back, I'm sorry, off in the backpack that that I pulled out. Okay, just keep your voice up, please, sir. Sorry, sir. And sir, are those keys in essentially the same condition that they were in that morning? Yes. I'd ask they be marked as the next exhibit. <coughs> Did you notice at that time, Officer Hubby, the red brown marks that are on some of these items? I did not. Thank you. water bottles, uh, officer, do you remember that? Yes, I did. And do you recognize the items I put in front of you? Yes, I do. What do you recognize those to be? Those are the two water bottles that were in the backpack. And are they in the same condition they were in? Yes, they are. I would ask those be marked as the next exhibit, but I'm afraid I've torn a bag. No, <laughs> Do you recognize the next item I put in front of you? Yes, I do. What do you recognize that to be? That was the uh, foot powder spray that was in the backpack. And is that like an athletic foot powder? Like a prevent athlete's foot, frankly? I believe so. Okay. <laughs> and is that canister in essentially the same condition it was in that early morning? Yes, it is. I'd ask that be marked as the next six of it. Describe some miscellaneous items in the bag, tape, um, pieces of paper, a flashlight. Do you recognize the contents of that bag as being sort of the balance of the contents of the backpack, other than other specific items you've described? Yes, I do. And are those in essentially the same condition, if maybe a little more jumbled than they were when you found them on the early morning of October 23rd? Yes. Uh, I believe by agreement these can go on as one exhibit, Your Honor. Go ahead. 
<laughs> now, Officer Hovey, at some point, did you have occasion to more carefully inventory the paper in um, the defendant's backpack? Yes, I did. And showing you specifically two receipts marked Wendy's, do you recognize those as being receipts that you located among the paper in the defendant's backpack? Yes. And are those in essentially the same condition they were in that morning? Yes. I'd ask those be marked as the next exhibit. for the Liberty Tree Mall movie theater. Do you recognize that item, sir? Yes, I do. And where was that item located? It was with the miscellaneous papers. In the defendant's back pocket? That is correct. And is there a name printed on that receipt? It's very small. <laughs> yes, there is. What is that name? Colleen Ritter. And I would ask that that be marked as the next exhibit. Objection, maybe Sir, I've handed you another item. Do you recognize what those are? Yes, I do. And what are those? Because they're bluish, greenish, teal colored sheer underwear. And where were those located? In the backpack. And other than some cutting done by the crime lab, are those in essentially the same condition they were in when you discovered them on October 23rd? Yes, they were. I would move these as the next exhibit, Your Honor. No, regarding the girl and you went into dispatch. Did you have any further conversation with the defendant at all that night? I answered some direct questions from him, but I had no questions of him. And what were those questions regarding? He asked me if he was could have a sneakers back or he was going to remain shoeless. And he also asked if he could have something to eat. And then he asked if he could have something to drink. And how did you respond to those questions? I said, uh, no, not at this time. And um, essentially, who was in charge of the defendant as of the time that you had contact with Danvers? Officer DiBernardo was with him. If I could just have a moment, Your Honor. Sure. I have nothing further for Officer Hobby. All right. Thank you. Officer, please. Awesome. Good morning. Good morning, sir. So the first question to him was, where are you going? Yes. Okay. He didn't turn to you? No, he did not. Didn't look at you? No, he did not. No facial expression to acknowledge your question? That's correct. But he did answer it? Yes, he did. He said nowhere? Correct. And after he said that, he still didn't turn to you? That's correct. No facial expression? That's correct. No eye contact? That's correct. So, and that's the, that's was what his demeanor was the whole time he was out there on the roadside with you? That's correct. Never varied? Excuse me, sir? He never varied, never deviated? Correct. You never felt you made any connection with him at all? That's correct. Okay. Did he appear to be staring off in the distance? Yes. And uh, were you able to see his face during this encounter? I was standing to the side of him, and then I then there was front, some front-facing 
Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. And uh, did you notice anything else about his facial expression while you were standing there? Nothing out of the ordinary. But he just kept staring? Yes. Right. Would you characterize him as dazed? As though that he wasn't understanding. Right. And you came back to the same question again pretty quickly, right? You asked him a second time. That's correct. And again, he said nowhere. Correct. And then you had some more conversation with him on the other side of the road. You moved him over there between the cruisers, right? That's correct. You gave him instructions? That's correct. Empty his pockets? That's correct. And um, when you did that, did he look at you? He looked straight ahead, but he was compliant. So he's continuing. And what direction is he looking while you're giving him those instructions? S straight ahead. Well, so what, what, what direction is he facing? Uh, northbound. All right. And the, the car trunk is in front of him? That's correct. Uh, he's not looking side to side? No, he's not. Where was your partner while you were giving him those instructions? He was behind him uh, to his left side. Uh -huh. Was he speaking at all? He did. Did he turn toward your partner when your partner spoke? No, he did not. But he complied with your instructions? Yes, he did. And then, um, I f forgive me if you already said this, but who's, who drove him back to the station? Which car was he in? I did, sir. All right. So, um, are you alone in the car with him at that point? Yes, sir. All right. I, I assume he's in the back seat? Yes, sir. All right. Did you try to make any conversation with him? No, I did not, sir. All right. Did he say anything? No, he did not. He just sat there? Yes, he did. And when you were putting him in the car, did he, did he turn to you or ask you anything? My partner put him in the car, sir. Right. Did you watch it? Yes. And how did he uh, respond with your partner moving him into the back seat of the car? My partner said to him, let's get you warm, sit in the back seat of the cruiser. And he said, okay, or yes. He said, okay? Yes. Okay. And then somebody had to help him up the stairs in the station from the garage up into the booking area? It's normal and customary for us. All right. So um, was there any conversation with him then? No, there was not. So, the, so from the moment you first approach him on the street until you're up in the booking area and going through his uh, inventorying his property more or less in front of him, the only, only thing he ever said up to that point was okay? Other than answering the questions. And then, answer, and then he answered your questions, your direct questions? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, you were... Uh, you look through the things you found in the backpack, correct? Correct. Okay, and you and you identified what the different paper items were, correct? Correct. You noticed the receipts and the you noticed the uh, person's name on them, correct? C correct. When you were going through those papers, was there any um, was there any contact information for anybody else amongst those papers? Not that I recall. No address. Was there a phone number on a piece of paper or anything like that? Nothing that I recall, sir. Right. And um, well, one, one, I mean, one of the things you wanted to know was where was he going, right? That was your first question to him. Yes. Right. But there was nothing you found in those papers that indicated that, he was, that somebody was going to meet or some place he was going to? Or That's correct. Or somebody was going to call? That's correct. He's just walking north on Route 1. That's correct. What's up there? Um, the next community would be Ipswich. And that's a fairly rural area also he would be walking along Route 1? Yes, sir. Right. And the further you go, the more rural it gets? Is that fair? Yes, sir. All right. I think you said that uh, when your, your partner asked him in your presence, what was in the bag? Did he, did he use the expression survival gear? Yes, he did. Could you, could you characterize that scuba knife as a survival knife? Yes, I could. All right. And uh, in that bag, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to go through it, was there some hand warmers in there? Yes, there was. All right. 
Is there anything else you could think of as something somebody would take into the wilderness with them? Nothing that I haven't already identified. Okay. And, and just to be clear, um, he wasn't wearing that knife and holster when you approached him. No, he was not. And the, um, the uh, box cutter that was it was completely secreted inside the wall and inside the inside the backpack. That's correct. Right. So in fact, he didn't have he didn't have any accessible weapons on his person when you stopped him on the road. I didn't know what he had on his person. Right. So that's how it turned out after you checked into it. Yes, sir. And the credit cards and identification with Miss Ritzer's name on it were in his in the pocket for his shorts. Yes, sir. Right. Including the driver's license. Two driver's licenses. Two driver's licenses. Right. By the way, after he after he. Had, answered your question about the apparent blood on the, on the uh, box cutter. And I think you said that uh, Officer DiBernardo then read him as Miranda rights. What, what did you do? After uh, I witnessed that, then I left and went into the dispatch area. Okay. And what did you do when you got to the dispatch area? I called Danvers Police. Okay. Um, didn't you have any, did it occur to you to try to ask him any more about this, about this box cutter and the blood on it? At that time I did not ask him. Were you instructed not to question him when you talked to Danvers? The second uh, phone call from Danvers, I was instructed not to. All right, so even if you were e either curious or concerned about the person whose blood it was, you'd been told not to ask any more questions, is that a fair assessment? The, uh, on the second phone call, yes. Okay. All right, but thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. Your next witness, Ms. McKeel. Officer Joe Bernardo. Okay, while well, the officer's um, coming in, could I see counsel at the sidebar for a moment, please? Please all I swear the testimony you're about to give in the cause now in hearing shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to have the God. Yes, ma'am. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, uh, there's been a motion to request the witnesses in the case, so until all the evidence is over, you can only be in the court when you're testifying. Yes, sir. Can't talk about your testimony, the other witnesses, or let them talk about the with you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before <coughs> this witness testifies, I'm going to give you a, um, an instruction. And uh, you'll notice uh, uh, throughout the uh, trial that there'll be times where uh, I give you an um, a, uh, instruction of law. 
And when I give you an instruction of law, you, you have to follow it and uh, keep in mind that instruction. For example, uh, there was a testimony uh, earlier the, uh, this morning concerning a, um, a, a statement, I believe, that uh, Officer uh, Nestor said that he heard that was admitted for a limited purpose, only for you to consider uh, his uh, knowledge or his state of mind. Uh, I'm now going to give you an um, a, um, instruction uh, concerning the uh, statements allegedly made by the uh, defendant at uh, the side of uh, the road that you just uh, heard, to, heard of. It's called a humane practice instruction. So you heard statements, uh, testimony about statements that the defendant allegedly uh, made at the side of the road on uh, Route 1 in Topsfield. Before you may consider any such statement made by the defendant, you're going to have to make a preliminary determination whether it may be considered as evidence or not. You may not consider any such statement in your deliberations unless, from all the evidence in the case, the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant made those alleged statements and that he did so freely, voluntarily, and rationally. In your deliberations, you may not consider any statement that the defendant made uh, at the side of the road unless the Commonwealth has proved beyond a reasonable doubt both that the defendant made the statement and it was voluntarily freely and rationally made. If the Commonwealth has met this burden, then you may consider the defendant's statement and rely on it and give it whatever weight or value or importance you believe it is fairly entitled to receive. In determining whether or not any statement made by the defendant was voluntary, you may consider all the surrounding circumstances. You can take into account the nature of any conversations that the police officers had with the defendant and the duration of any questioning if there was any. You may consider whether the statement was made and whether it was made. You may consider the defendant's physical and mental condition, his intelligence, age, education, experience, and personality. Your decision does not turn on any one factor. You must consider the totality of the circumstances. It's not enough that the statement was voluntary in the sense that it was not forced or tricked out of the defendant by physical intimidation or psychological pressure. It must be made freely and voluntarily. And uh, before... Um, uh, Ms. McDougall, you uh, question this witness. I just want to add one more thing, check with counsel on one more issue, if I could, please. So ladies and gentlemen, that um, instructor.